So here we are in a new episode of uh, Confessions podcast. We keep on talking about activism in the region of Western Balkans. Today with me from Albania, Arber Kodra, who is an activist and the executive director of OMSA, which stands for Open Mind Spectrum Albania. Uh, This is a non-governmental organization, a young one, founded in 2013, with a main focus of its work being community work and advocacy. Um, it It aspires an Albanian society where every individual, regardless of their sexual orientation, gender identity, gender, color, age, and other parts of their identity, gets to enjoy full rights and freedoms. Arber, thank you uh, for being my guest in this podcast. Thank you for the invitation. Now let's begin with uh, getting an insight into a broader context of the state of human rights in Albania today. How would you assess them, of course, with a focus on the LGBTI population? Well, I think uh, the situation, the status of the human rights in Albania is not uh, uh, the perfect one, to to be honest, because uh, even though we have uh, national election plans for uh, um, the marginalized communities in Albania, but again, there is a lack of implementation, because the plan and the measures and the objectives of all of the groups are really good, but if the implementation would be on place, then we will have like a, a more uh, respect or a more advancement of the human rights in Albania. In regards to the LGBTI community, uh, again, we have uh, this year the third uh, national election plan for LGBTI persons in Albania, which uh, this is uh, a more longer, much more longer plan from 2021 uh, until 2027, which this uh, period will come cover a lot of changes that uh, us as LGBTI organizations has asked uh, to the to the government in order to forward the change the changes that uh, we need of course there are a lot of uh, a lot of measures and a lot of uh, ministries uh, involved. The main ministry who is in charge uh, of the, as a coordination uh, ministry and the coordination group is the Ministry of Health and Social Protection. But again, now not to, not to make uh, uh, a defense to the Ministry of Health, but the Ministry of Health has the, all the, the responsibility, which does not have to be only their responsibility, because there are all these actors that I mentioned involved in order to have a proper implementation. So um, what I'm hearing is that you do have a good legal framework, but that in everyday life things are not as good as they should be according to the law. For example, in Bosnia and Herzegovina, a lot of the law content when it comes to protecting different kinds of human rights, including LGBTI population, are more oriented towards stopping discrimination than towards giving rights, such as um, being able to live in a same-sex marriage or community and um, more rights concerning these kinds of aspects of life. But what's it like in Albania when it comes to this dimension? Yeah, in fact, uh, I had the opportunity to work uh, with the Balkans, being as the first uh, member, uh, board member of the Equal Rights Association for Western Balkans and Turkey for 2015-2017. And in regards, when you compare Albania to the other countries uh, in the Balkans, we are uh, really uh, much more, much more better uh, in terms of violence. Uh, of course, there are sporadic cases of physical violence and. Uh, and verbal violence, but in terms of legal changes, for example, you know, we have the anti-discrimination law, we have changes in the penal code or in other uh, other laws. Uh, The only uh, law that uh, we have asked since 2013 to our government has not passed, uh, that is the changes of the family code and respectively articles uh, 163-164 that uh, are uh, that describe uh, the change uh, for the same-sex couples but not the marriages uh, the civil unions because even here the media make mistakes when they speak about that in order to to have uh, for their own purposes that we know but we are not asking for the marriage yet but for the civil unions in order to be equal in front of the law so this, this is the the situation. It's a 13 years movement which has made big steps in order to, uh, uh, in comparison to other uh, movements. 
Yes, it's the same um, definitely in Bosnia and Herzegovina when it comes to the state of the rights that now um, are being looked for. Um, one of the important and challenging issues you work on through your organization, but in your individual capacities as well, is educating parents how to accept their children. Um, so this is how, among other things, I understand activism. It's something that brings the, the core change and it, uh, it's, it's addressing an issue that practically affects everyday life of LGBTI population. Now, where does this come from? Is it from your personal experience or is it from listening to the needs of young LGBTI people? In fact, this uh, started, uh, the group called I Am Your, Ch I Am Your Child started uh, as a personal story as I had a lot of problems to accept uh, myself uh, and uh, my mother made me the situation to, ca to, com to come out to her. What does it mean? That um, she wanted m me not anymore to suffer uh, and uh, uh, so she, ex she exposed and offered herself in order to, uh, to make me feel better and to live free as I want. Uh, then in 2012, the American uh, Embassy in, uh, in Albania decided to organize the first uh, uh, regional conference in Tirana. So there were uh, all the people from the region and they invited uh, two mothers. One of them was my mother in order to, to give, uh, as, as, as a supportive mother, to give this, this uh, experience through a speech. When I asked her, in fact, I was hesitating because she never gave uh, a speech uh, in front of 300 people. So it was a little bit difficult, but uh, she and uh, this other mother, they both made it. And it was really uh, two uh, touch, very touchy speeches uh, of them. And then from this moment all started. Uh, my mother uh, ha had the idea to go and work with other parents that have LGBTI people, but not only. Also parents that they don't know that they have, which is the majority of the cases. But also education of parents and families in general to have at least the information in order to accept uh, their uh, children, no matter their sexual orientation is. So this, is star this started firstly as my personal experience, then as the needs for the LGBTI community because we saw that uh, uh, for f to my mom and to this other mom they were having uh, phone calls or meeting in a coffee with them in order to be understood how they are so uh, acceptive with uh, uh, with uh, me and with the other guy that was the other mother so this is how it all started and we are continuing in fact today we had the fifth meeting of during the week we were in different cities all around Albania uh, in order to speak about uh, family education and a book uh, because we are part of the European network of parents of LGBTI people that is established in Malta. And uh, this book are the real stories of parents from all over Europe and there's only one story from Albania which is uh, my story said from the perspective of my mother. So uh, this book uh, is giving that education uh, to hear and to learn from the pers perspective of parents and how is their, jour their journey through this. That's amazing. That's, that's such, uh, such a sensitive way of creating a support system that is necessary for achieving any other rights or for having the need to achieve any other rights beginning from being accepted in your own, um, in your own circle, in your own family, in your own household. So that's some really amazing work you're doing. Um, to get back to the questions of equality and inequality, what would you say are the most challenging consequences of inequality, but speaking in terms of mental health? Uh, well, this is a very delicate issue, in fact, because uh, uh, the mental health is really uh, something uh, very uh, important, especially for the LGBTI community. And speaking, for example, coming from my personal experience uh, and how my mental health was before uh, accepting myself, because following the rules uh, of the society and uh, that the society has put uh, and being raised in a patriarchal country, this caused a lot of uh, mental health problems. And that's why, for example, I asked for a psychologist when I was 19. In a period then, even now, there it exists a stigma when you ask for uh, some uh, 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 professional help from the psychologist, then people think that you are sick or you are uh, crazy or whatever. So imagine by that time, 
uh, and uh, I'm in fact, there is a fact, and I feel very sorry that even nowadays, as we speak today, the LGBTI community has a lot of uh, mental health problems and is one of the issues that is less being talked and is one of the issues that even from the donors is not, uh, is not very much uh, uh, on their interest uh, or uh, requested. So, Would you say that these um, psychologists and psychotherapists who are working with people and providing support, are they educated? on how to be sensible towards this situation. Was your experience in that sense good? To, to tell the truth, uh, I'm telling you my personal experience, I changed three psychologists because I was not feeling uh, very good with uh, the first two. And the last one was, re was uh, she has studied abroad and she is a very well-known one and she is one of the people that I refer to from the LGBTI community. This means that uh, talking with the psychologists in the country, uh, okay, not all of them are uh, educated on the issue. Huh? And uh, there are cases that coming from the community that even they feel uh, like they want to change them, want to make them change, even though from 2020 uh, we have um, uh, the cha we don't have any more the conversion therapy and Albania is in the in the, uh, it's the sixth country in Europe that uh, has, uh, has not this uh, therapy anymore, which is really very good, uh, but uh, it really needs an education with the psychologist uh, system. Uh, in fact, this was one of the issues that we, um, we talked yesterday in one of our meetings, uh, because uh, they were saying, uh, two, uh, there were two students from the Faculty of Social Sciences, which they were saying, even the teacher who is a psychologist, she does not touch the issue, the, this issue of the LGBTI community, but imagine we were in a city outside, two hours outside of Tirana, of the capital, which the, the, the teacher has, the, the professor has like this stigma and this uh, internal homophobia or discrimination or even the fear how this will be perceived from the students, uh, which in Tirana is a little bit different, not all, but it's really uh, different. Uh, and on to my perspective that this year I gave five lectures in universities here uh, with teachers that are really open, uh, open-minded in order to talk with the issue. We have in the national action plan with the system of education for teachers, psychologists and everything, but there is, it is very difficult to work with the Ministry of, uh, of Education because of parents, uh, which this is one of our challenging issues. Yes, um, I ask, I'm, um, I'm a psychologist and a psychotherapist in education and I know that acceptance is one of the main, uh, main things that need to happen in the relationship between a psychologist and the person sitting across them in order to achieve any kind of improvement. So sensitizing uh, professional mental health workers should be one of the goals of the political institutions and the society altogether. Um, Another issue you work on is really interesting and it's political participation of LGBTI people. So is there any at the current time? <laughs> this is one of my, uh, one of my uh, the issues that I, I really love it because like it's, uh, we started this uh, in 2016 uh, and we had the first uh, uh, political forum. Um, in Tirana by the time which uh, we have we had only two politicians one uh, of, from the ruling party and one from the opposition and uh, we invited as a keynote speaker by the time she was the vice head of the European Parliament uh, Ulrika Lunacek is her name from the Greens the Green Party from Vienna and she was the keynote speaker and all the others were people from uh, not from the community but uh, people, I mean, our supporters, uh, donors, or very few uh, institutions or young people. So uh, after this, we decided to, or to create uh, the first research uh, in the country, which is about political participation of LGBTI people, to see a little bit how is the real situation with the political parties. Uh, and then the culmination was in 2018, we organized the very first uh, conference in collaboration with the Albanian parliament, inside the parliament in fact, which that was the most challenging one. But from the findings, um, the majority of the, of the LGBTI community uh, are voting for the Socialist Party, which is uh, in, uh, in a role, uh, which... Um, 
to be honest, the the situation with the parties, uh, the big parties, like uh, the three big um, uh, big biggest parties that we have uh, uh, in Albania, they have a neutral uh, position, so neither pro or neither against it. Uh, uh, in, and the other uh, small parties, they have uh, a more, let's say, open uh, open statement, like uh, what they um, they are pro or they are against it. But again, this is not. Uh, this is a very small and very. Uh, it's a situation that needs really uh, a change. Uh, because we did semi-structured interviews with politicians, with, uh, to my perspective, uh, not only to my perspective, but I'm the only one who worked directly with them. Uh, with the politicians here is that you can meet with you can meet with them like in an in a non-formal like in a coffee to have a discussion like that. If you invite them to conferences or whatever, this is this fear that what well, will be the statement and uh, the fear that uh, they will lose votes, which is the biggest fear of them. Eh? But uh, after this, for example, we continued. We did trainings with, uh, firstly, we started with the youth political forums all over Albania in nine cities. It was really, really challenging uh, because, uh, you know, there exists also not my, the stigma that I am from the LGBTI community, but inside their, uh, their community of the youth political forums. Uh, and, it, and then to take in consideration that the city that they are and uh, what exists in their city, in their community, discrimination or stigma, whatever. After that, uh, last year, we did the first guide for the political parties with, uh, with support and technical support from the only institute that is in the US for political participation, which is Victory Institute. And this guide is very simple. In fact, what the political parties has to do with the LGBTI community and the marginalized groups. Uh, the situation is that we don't have any, uh, any politician who is out, even though we we doubt that there are some <laughs> from the community, but um, we don't know yet uh, 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 what will happen. The situation that I'm sure is that uh, there are two options uh, for the LGBTI community to, to run for office. One is, or as an um, uh, independent candidate, or in the in the municipality, so in the council of the municipality, this is how uh, we can start. Uh, this is for sure. Then um, there is a lot of work to do uh, with them because, for example, now that the government has changed, we don't have these three politicians that we had before, in order to uh, that who were who was who were fighting for us uh, and changing some laws and making some some uh, really uh, uh, decis uh, de decisive challenges in order to, to change the situation of the LGBTI community. But again, for example, even in meetings that I have with them, there are people, politicians that are not, uh, that are not, uh, that are politicians that are not out, and uh, um, not, not, not out, but there are politicians that uh, they are not out of the issue. And uh, when I ask them, like, okay, what is the problem? And they say, the problem is not you or the LGBTI community. But this is how I'm raised from my mom. I'm raised like this, with these concepts, and I cannot change uh, it. But again, then comes the discussion that you are not there on your own uh, perspective, but you are a decision maker. You make the law changes, etc., etc. So You represent the society which includes the LGBTI people. They also vote. Yeah. Exactly. We have the Pride tomorrow, for example, let's see who will join. <laughs> is it, when it comes to the Pride, like, what is the relationship of the society towards the Pride? You've had a break during the pandemic because, I mean, everybody did because people couldn't gather, but uh, is there support from people from the public life in general, like uh, not only politicians, but some celebrities, I don't know, singers, actors, journalists? Yeah. Yes, in fact, this is the 10th Pride, and last year, uh, not last year, but uh, the last Pride was in 2019, which uh, that last Pride has the majority, the majority of the people were from the LGBTI community, but always we have supporters, we have our friends, we have, of course, donors and embassies and whatever, but the number is growing of the supporters, like, for example, I remember the last one, we had mothers with children, no? we had uh, other young people who are supporters, not only from the LGBTI community. Uh, now the uh, tomorrow for the pride tomorrow the community has uh, they want to be part of it but in order not to be 
uh, out, they have asked, unfortunately, for masks to cover all of their faces in order not to be uh, to be known or to be recognized from their families. Uh, again, uh, the, uh, the the situation of the pride, even though the the COVID nineteen, uh, we organized also uh, a virtual pride that was with one hundred or one hundred and fifty people, something like that. So there is this um, support coming from uh, our friends and changing uh, year by year, which is really, really great. Um, from the celebrities, uh, this year for the first time we will have a concert that are four, uh, four uh, singers who will be with us. Then uh, celebrities, for example, comes also at the, at the gala. There is a, an annual gala, is a fundraising gala for the shelter of the LGBTI people, which this year will be by the end of May, the 31st, which also there there are artists who are coming to support the cause for free, huh? uh, which is really important. Uh, in terms of journalists, uh, we, have, uh, we work with media a lot, uh, especially with those... Uh, fantastic headlines and bombastic headlines that they do which are not necessary in order to disinform the public because that those headlines disinform the public in a way that then we have to go in the media and to explain and re-explain it again. But the, the media situation is, is good in terms of we have a space in the media, the media is very positive in order to to show the, the role models and the positive cases, not only what the media has done in the beginning in order to show only one category, for example, the trans people that were living in the streets, which uh, everyone was portraying us as those persons and not some other, and uh, not the other part of the community. Now, as, as we um, get to the end of the conversation, one question that I have for you is why? Why are you doing all of this? I mean, where does the urge for activism come from? Since you've told me that you've had this good experience of acceptance inside your family from your mother, I've read your um, biography, you speak like a hundred languages, you're well educated, you could have lived your life doing any other profession and having a steady life, waiting for somebody else to bring the changes, to lobby, to protests, because I mean, that, that's what the majority of population does. What is your drive for activism? In fact, this started, I'll tell you how this started, it's a very good question, in fact. Uh, it started because, okay, I knew that I have a supportive, I had a supportive family because they were, they are uh, well-educated, working in business and well-traveled and all of this. Um, the problem of accepting myself was really, really high. And at the moment that I understood who I was, I was always, uh, hiding it and denying it from myself and for a long time uh, I had this experience with a psychologist for four years until the, at the moment that this uh, um, the thing that who I was came out uh, again then I I was uh, put I put myself into into decisions I said or I will kill myself which I will never do because I love life or I will stand up and raise the voice for me first for my rights and then for other people that does not have the courage even nowadays that we speak today to, with you that uh, they cannot raise their voice so this is not only uh, not that in, uh, this is not only but this is not a job for me this is a real life thing uh, uh, which this is my drive um, to give the contribution as much as I can for other people of the community that are like me to breathe and to live their life. Uh, I know that freedom has a lot of costs, but uh, me, uh, take my, uh, to take my personal story, I took this, um, uh, this risk for, this, for the, for, uh, the costs that the uh, coming out has in order to be free and uh, to be a voice for the other that does not have, uh, have the courage, as I said. Uh, on the other side, on a side note, in fact, I want to say that because the community always asks, but okay, we can come out, but, but we cannot be like you, like uh, an outspoken activist or being in the media or this and that. We always, and I always say to them, to, to accept yourself and to come out does not mean to go in the media and to take the flag and to be an activist. But you have to feel good and to, f to be good under your own skin. Eh? The activism will do us that we decided to do that or other people uh, that decide to do that. So this is why. <laughs>
Thank you. Thank you for this answer and thank you for providing very intimate details about the roots of your activism. And the part where you said that it's not a job for you, I mean, that's very visible even for me. I'm speaking yeah. to you for the first time in my life and that's very visible. Uh, to conclude the conversation, I would like to hear a short message from you to any people, any uh, anyone in, in the search for their identity, anyone struggling under the pressure of society for being LGBTI, for young people, for people of all generations in the Balkans, I would like to, to hear a message from you addressed towards them, but also what would you say to those who are on the other side, to those who are oppressors and to those who are denying LGBTI population their rights? Firstly, to the LGBTI community, that uh, the LGBTI community does not have to, to deny or to, uh, to deny who they are and who we are, uh, because there is nothing wrong with us. And I, I understand and I know that the, the pressure from the society is very high, but uh, the community has to take, to take this risk and to take these costs in order to be free and to live their life, because there is only one life and we will die one day. So we have to live it as, as we want to live it, not as others want us to do. To the other part of the suppressors, <laughs> I have to say that we are here, we are a family. Uh, I'm happy that we have this motto also of the Pride Parade that we are a family, which means a lot for us. And uh, to all of those that say that God does not love us and God wants us to be killed and whatever, so want to support what they say, I always say don't put yourself in the name of God in order to discriminate and to, to do hate speech to the LGBTI community or other communities. Because if we are part of this world, God loved us and the motto is to love each other and to support each other no matter what. Thank you very much, Arbert. This was a very inspiring, actually, conversation for me. I'm a, personally a huge supporter of the LGBTI yeah, population, of all human rights, but always getting to listen um, to personal stories, to the roots of activism people, choose to be, their, to be their life paths also reminds me on the role we all have to support each other in our different fights. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, though, and thank you for the work you do. Thank you. So here we are um, at the end of the episode. Arber Kodra from OMSA, Albania, was my guest. I guess the lesson we all got to learn is about acceptance, acceptance of yourself, acceptance of others. It's a beautiful feeling. Try it out and... Um, Watch the next episode as well. Thank you for your attention.